Ladies and gentlemen, I'm hereby officially calling these proceedings to order. Good evening, everyone. You can do better than that. Show me a little more love. <laughs> On three. One, two, three. Good evening. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, before we begin uh, the proceedings this afternoon, I'm going to ask that everyone uh, pull out their cell phones. I want to see cell phones. Everybody in here has a cell phone. Now, now, what I want you to do is to push the off button. Uh, and uh, the obvious reason is that we don't want the interruption uh, during the program. The less obvious reason is that because of technology, we don't want the confluence of all of these waves interfering with our efforts to uh, 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 take the uh, proceeding. So we would appreciate your cooperation uh, in that regard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, would you please rise and join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, His Excellency Rupia Banda, the former president of Zambia and Boston University's new African presidential lecturer, and his lovely wife, Tandiwe. <laughs> yeah. Escort them to their seats around on that side, please. Uh, you may be, be seated, Mr. President. We'll, we'll call you up a little later. We go. <laughs> I would uh, like to take this time to recognize some people in our audience tonight. I already referenced uh, the former First Lady of Zambia, uh, Tandiwe Banda. Uh, let's give her another round of applause. <clears throat> uh, likewise, I would like to uh, uh, a a recognize Dr. Beverly Brown, the Director of Development at the Center for Global Health and Development. Um, and, and also the first lady of our, our campus. I met with uh, uh, President Bond and I met earlier with uh, uh, Bob uh, uh, Brown, the president of this distinguished uh, university. And uh, you know, he, he's pulled in many different ways, so he's not able to be with us tonight. But uh, I emphatically punctuated it uh, uh, in my conversation with him this morning that I thought we were really getting the better half of this deal. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, the Dean of Students, uh, Kenneth Elmore, and I'll say more about him later. Uh, Dr. Uh, Leonard, uh, uh, Linda Haywood, who is a member of our, uh, our advisory board and also a professor. Uh, at BU in African American in, uh, in African American Studies, and Dr. Tim Loman, uh, the director of the BU African Studies Center. Uh, Con Hurley, I think, is uh, here tonight, uh, who is the director of the Center for Finance and Law. Uh, Dr. Walter Fluker, uh, a longtime friend of the African Presidential Center, uh, and uh, a member of. Uh, the BU African Studies uh, Center as well. Uh, Walter uh, and I, and, and I'm going to pause on and say a bit more about him, uh, not simply because he's wearing a bow tie and I have an affinity for folks <laughs> who uh, uh, demonstrates, uh, demonstrate such uh, sartorial excellence. Uh, but uh, we go back uh, many, uh, many years and uh, he was formerly on the faculty at Morehouse College in Atlanta uh, as we were starting this consortium. And it was uh, in no small part to his uh, commitment uh, to the African Presidential Center and our work uh, that we've been able to have the success that we've had over the past 10 years. So I want to thank you, uh, my friend. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize uh, Dr. Vivian Schmidt, the, the director of the BU Center for International Relations, uh, Marvin Gilmore, uh, the president of the Community Development of Co uh, Corporation of, uh, of Boston. Let's give them all a rousing round of applause. Um, I would also like to reference uh, some friends of, Z of Zambia from the BU community. Uh, Dr. John Simon and his team at the Center for Global Health and uh, Development. This center, uh, and I'm very proud of the BU affiliation, this center has been working in Zambia since uh, the early uh, mid-1990s. Uh, and there are a number of, of folks from the, the center here tonight. I'm going to ask them to, to just stand, uh, and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> They're doing uh, some, some very important work uh, in, uh, uh, in research. Uh, they have a large country portfolio working on uh, everything from neonatal survival uh, to HIV uh, AIDS. Uh, likewise, there are a number of uh, uh, Zambian uh, 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 citizens and students uh, here tonight, and some have traveled as far away as, as Texas, and that's a little bit of a hike. Uh, and so I'm going to ask them to stand, and let's give them a rousing round of applause. Again, I welcome all of you, and I thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, I invite you to engage each other, because there's some very interesting people here tonight, uh, and uh, to enjoy the meal, and we will commence uh, shortly with the formal proceedings. Bon appetit. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I might uh, have your attention, uh, we're about to uh, continue our program uh, this evening. Uh, before I uh, introduce uh, Dean Kenneth Elmore, who will bring greetings on behalf of the university, uh, I do want to acknowledge a couple of other colleagues in the audience. Dean. Hardin Coleman of the School of Education, uh, and Vita Palladino, the director of the Gottlieb Center. Let's give them a round of applause. It's good to, <clears throat> to see them present uh, and accounted for tonight. I mentioned to uh, His Excellency that uh, one of the things about this uh, crowd, and, it, and it's a great crowd. Look at you. Look good. You're <laughs> intelligent. You're well-behaved. I mean, uh, in, in, in all seriousness, I, I did punctuate uh, one thing about which I'm, I'm very proud as I look out uh, about this room, and that is the, the diversity, uh, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, ethnically, and that's important, but for a, uh, an academic community, uh, it is important that we uh, uh, create the kind of programming that is of interest uh, to our students and faculty. But uh, for an urban university like Boston University, you know, one of the ways that you mitigate the, the, the potential of the, the town-gown divide is that you continually look for ways to open the university up to the broader community. And that we've got this kind of cross-section present tonight is something about which we feel very good. Uh, and that, you, that we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, give yourselves another round of applause. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, and distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dean Kenneth Elmore, uh, who's the Dean of Students here at Boston University. Uh, as the Dean, he oversees more than 400 student organizations and is uh, to, to call him a, a well-loved figure here on the BU campus is really an understatement. Uh, Dean Elmore previously served as associate director at the BU Office of Residential Life 
and also as associate director for staff and operations in the same office. Prior to Boston University, he practiced law in Boston at Peabody and Arnold, and, and uh, uh, prior to that, uh, or subsequent to that, at Morgan, Brown, and Joy. Uh, but for me, uh, the, 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 despite, despite this, the extent to which he's credentialed and the various roles that uh, he's performed here at BU, the thing that uh, I appreciate about him uh, is that, one, uh, he is uh, one of the members of the Boston University community that understood what we were trying to accomplish at the African Presidential Center from the onset. Uh, and he has always been supportive of our work. And for this, I'm uh, grateful. Uh, now, I must also uh, uh, add that uh, I'm a bit envious of the dean. Uh, and uh, the reason being that he is the standard in Boston University for engaging the student community. Uh, my staff has figured out whenever they need to motivate me to do something, they all, they, all they have to say is, well, you know, Dean Elmore does this. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've since rebranded our center from the African Presidential Archives and Research Center to the African Presidential Center. And so they said, we've got a tweet now. And I said, but I don't want to tweet. They said, Dean Elmore tweets. <laughs> I said, we've got a blog now. I don't want a blog. But you know, Dean Elmore blogs. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> He, he, he's become the, the, the impetus for our good work in another way. It's my pleasure to introduce our friend uh, and the friend of this community, Dean uh, Kenneth Elmore. Well, thank you, Ambassador. I'm going to be watching your tweets now. Right. We'll see how you do. Uh, good evening. I've, I've got a real simple task. They said you need to make sure that you extend welcomes on behalf of the university and be brief. So I'll see what we can do here. I'm going to add a little bit, too. I think I have to give a shout out as well. So from an official standpoint, I think I have to say uh, distinguished guests, be you faculty, deans, administrators, and of course, students. It's a great pleasure and certainly an honor that I could be here tonight to welcome you all to this inaugural lecture of His Excellency Rupaya Banda. It's wonderful for me especially to see so many students here. Absolutely wonderful to see these young faces. They're always beautiful, they're always well dressed, and they most certainly better be well behaved. <laughs> uh, now with that, before I go any further with the official welcome, let me give a shout out. I certainly want to also shout out to my friend, Ambassador Charles Stith, and his staff. And I, at the African Presidential Center at the university, I want to give the shout out for organizing tonight's event. It's a testament, I think, to both the university itself and the center uh, that President Bond accepted this invitation to be in residence here at the university. And you probably all know that the university has more than 55 years of excellence in the field of African studies. For me, it's been a real privilege. It's been a real wonderful sort of thing to see the center, the African Presidential Center, grow over the years. And the past 10 years, I think it's been 10 years, the past 10 years, the guests and the programs that the center brings to the university, campus, and I think also to the Boston community, you heard reference to that, expands our understanding, our knowledge, and appreciation for leadership in Africa. And that's something that we don't get in the mainstream as much as we should. You know, interestingly, as an aside, I. I we talk a little bit about how maybe a viral video, a poorly done viral video, might have done more to at least tweak people enough to think a little bit about Africa than we ever had thought before. I hope that we can start to play even more of a role, certainly the center and certainly the African studies programs and the African American studies program to do more and, and, and to go a little deeper with that. But I applaud you for what your, you and your staff for the work that you've been doing. Finally, the welcome. President Banda, on behalf of the uh, president of the university here, President Robert A. Brown, on behalf of our provost, Pro Provost Jean Morrison, and certainly on behalf of the faculty, the staff, and students of Boston University, I welcome you to the university, and it's a real honor to be able to do that. I look forward to your remarks this evening. With that, let me turn it back over to Ambassador Stith for the uh, formal proceedings. Thank you, Dean. Tonight's inaugural lecture 
marks the formal start of President Banda's residency here at the African Presidential Center. President Banda is serving as the eighth resident uh, here at Boston University and follows a rich tradition of participants in this program. Uh, those who preceded him include uh, the father of modern Zambia, uh, Kenneth Kaunda, uh, Ruth Sando Perry, the former uh, president of Liberia, Carl Offman, the former president of Mauritius, uh, Sir Ketamil Masiri, the former president of Botswana, Antonio Montiero, the former president of Cape Verde, uh, Festus Mohai, the former president of Botswana, and uh, many of you would recall that uh, last year, uh, Amani Karume, the former president of Zanzibar, uh, served in residence here. Uh, you continue, Mr. President, a great and grand tradition. Our residency program offers former African heads of state and government the opportunity to share their experiences with the Boston University community and the community at large. Uh, in that vein, uh, this week, uh, President Bonda will be traveling to uh, Atlanta uh, to lecture for two days at Morehouse College, and the week after that to Elizabeth City, uh, North Carolina, uh, to spend a couple of days at Elizabeth City State University. Uh, we'll have him across the river uh, in a week or so at uh, MIT. Uh, among the schools that uh, he will uh, make presentations uh, to. We're particularly excited about uh, his being with us uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first of which, uh, this is a particularly interesting time on the continent. Uh, last year, uh, around this time, uh, Africa and that whole Arab Peninsula was much in the news because of the Arab Spring. Uh, people were yearning, responding to freedom's call. And the world focused on the aspirations of the peoples in that region uh, in a way that we hadn't for a while. The thing that struck me uh, as I toured the continent during that period was that some of Africa's most vibrant, viable, nascent democracies were also experiencing some challenges as well. And during these very difficult and trying times, there were leaders like President Banda who were trying to hold the center. And to have him here uh, to share his experiences and insights uh, the challenges uh, that he had as uh, a president of Zambia at a very important period in its history is a unique and special opportunity uh, for us. Likewise, uh, this is a special opportunity for me because of our personal relationship. Uh, he is a man of great dignity and honor and integrity a man of profound sensitivity, uh, not only for the people for whom uh, he was charged to lead, but a sensitivity to the needs of a, a broader world. Uh, and it's always great to be in, company, in the company of people of that sort. In that vein, uh, mm -hmm. it is special to have him here as an African champion, and one of the great defenders of democracy. Our eighth African president in residence, His Excellency Rupia Banda. Mr. President.
Thank you. Leave me alone, Abby. Thank you. <clears throat> Ambassador Steith, Ken Helmo, Dean of Students, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to address you this evening. Let me begin by taking a moment to express my deep gratitude to Ambassador Stith, the African Presidential Center, and Boston University for having invited me to participate in this program. On behalf of my wife and family, we are also grateful to the center staff for all their generous support in making our move to Boston a convenient and comfortable one, as, as comfortable as possible. I would also like to recognize Dr. Beverly Brown, a professor at the university, but also the first lady of this great university. I met with President Robert Brown this morning. He was extremely gracious in welcoming me and my family to the university. Now let me focus on my remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons I'm here is because I have gained notoriety, hopefully temporarily, for having lost, for having not won my last election. <laughs> that might make me Boston University's very first president in residence who appears before you as an example of the other side of democracy. <laughs> what happens? Thank you. What happens when this cherished system of rules produces different outcomes? But I ask everyone here to take a moment to reflect, what does it mean that we are so surprised when an incumbent African president loses an election and hands over power to another party? Isn't it disappointing to see such low expectations for African democracy illustrated in such a manner? In a way, I am grateful to President Abdullahi Wade of Senegal, who just stepped aside after being defeated at the ballot that box by my, at the ballot box by Mr. Maki Sal, perhaps lifting the burden somewhat from my shoulders. <laughs> Though, of course, it is entirely a different question when a leader has been in power for more than a decade. Many of the students here will undoubtedly be familiar with various academic definitions of democracy. But today, one that strikes me comes from a political scientist named Adam Przeworski, who once wrote the following. Democracy is a system in which parties lose elections. There are parties divisions of interest, values, and opinions. There is competition organized by rules, and there are periodic winners and periodic losers. In other words, when we talk about governance, we must also speak about the process of selecting the leadership and the ongoing functioning of fair system that continually reflects the desire, desires and will of the citizens as a limitation on executive power. There are many things of which I am proud during my time as president of Zambia. One of which is the process of my seeding 
from office. The process by which you live is as important as that by which you come in. I am proud that my administration left with great dignity, affording my successor the opportunity to succeed or fail based on his policies, not because of political traps laid by those he followed. Let me add that I made the transition from power complete. On my own accord, I even rel relinquished the leadership position of my party. I did so because I believe past presidents must give future leadership an opportunity to emerge. <laughs> For democracy to flourish, there must be a continuing stream of individuals of integrity and ideas with promise. There must be room for a new generation of leaders to rise to solve the next generation of problems. If democracy is going to be secure, in, if democracy in countries like Zambia, <clears throat> if demo development is going to take root, all leaders can't, can't cling to power or attempt to consolidate it at all costs. There comes a time when leaders must step aside and become statesmen, elder or not, and stop seeing themselves as a personification of the state. Again, let me say, that's why I applaud President Wadi's conceding power in Senegal. Before I go further, while I am proud of how I left office, let me state for the record that I am very proud of my achievements while in office. During my time as Zambia's president, we grew the economy at over 7% seven and, over seven a year, despite our beginning in the wallows of the 2008 global financial crisis, making us a unique star of our continent. We lifted thousands of people out of poverty and created hundreds of thousands of private sector jobs while focusing on critical social needs such as health care and education. I'm also proud of my campaign last fall in an election contested by three major, uh, major parties and seven smaller parties. Our party secured the votes of 35% of the country and lost by a narrow margin of around 180,000 votes in a hard-fought contest. My goal from the beginning of my career in public service was to leave Zambia more united as a nation and a better place to live in when, when, than when I started. And it is my hope that history will show that we were successful. This was not a modest goal, and as I shall explain, achieving unity among all Zambians, no matter what region or tribe they come from, is decidedly more challenging than America's impressive patriotism. And so today, I have the privilege of speaking before this distinguished forum to share some of these experiences, providing a personal perspective on issues of African democracy and governance. In future lectures, we will expand our discussions to cover broader regional experiences. But today, I shall focus on what I know best, the political system of Zambia. 
As, as you may be aware, I became the fourth elected president of the Republic of Zambia in October 2008, a landlocked country <clears throat> surrounded by eight neighbors in the center of Southern Africa. <clears throat> Zambia covers about 752,618 kilometers, square kilometers, with a population of about 13 million people and home to a diverse 73 tribal groupings. Our gross domestic product estimates, estimate hovers around 19.1 billion United States dollars, while the GDP per capita is around 1,400 United States dollars, making Zambia a lower middle income country by World Bank standards. Zambia fought for its independence from the British. It was granted in the, on the 24th of October, 1964. And as such, it will not be surprising that our government structure closely follows the British parliamentary model the British parliamentary model. In that regard, we have an executive branch headed by an elected president, a legislature headed by a speaker elected by the members of parliament, representing our diverse regions, and the judiciary headed by the appointed chief justice. All these structures are intended to operate on a principle of separation of powers and non-interference, particularly by the executive in the running of the judiciary and the legislature. And as I shall explain later, it is how this separation of powers is managed that becomes very important in the consolidation of democracy in Zambia and in Africa in general. As you may know, from 1973 to 1991, Zambia was not a pure democracy, but rather a democracy preceded by an adjective. When President Kenneth Kaunda issued a constitutional amendment known as the Chona Declaration in 1973, Zambia became technically known as a one-party participatory democracy. The only party allowed to contest elections at that time was the United National Independence Party. When I was a young diplomat serving in postings to Washington, D.C. and to the United Nations, I was a member of the United National Independence Party, along with the majority of Zambia's future leadership, including the current president, President Michael Sata. As the country's economy and political situation deteriorated from the mid-1970s through the late 1980s, pressure to return to multi-party politics by the nascent movement for the multi-party democracy, MMD, which opposed the one-party state of UNIP, was heightened. By 1991, the opposition MMD achieved its goal of returning Zambia to a competitive, multi-party democratic system when President Frederick Chiluba defeated Kaunda in a landslide election victory. Our experience with this historic transfer of power from UNIP to the MMD after 27 years under one party was based on the resounding popular will of the people. As citizens became disillusioned with the government's failure to meet their expectations, it was this experience that earned Zambia its credentials as a country that truly champions competitive democracy and enshrines these values in its constitution. President Chiluba served for two terms, spinning 10 years. Levi Mwanawasa was elected as president in 2001, who would later extend an invitation to me to serve as his vice president in 2006. 
He served for about seven years. Ladies and gentlemen, as I now reflect on my presidency and on democratic governance in Zambia, from, from the moment I stood for the presidency, I understood the challenges our country faced. This was reflected in my inaugural address of the foot, at the footsteps of our parliament on November 2, 2008. I pledged to be a president for all Zambians, to deliver economic prosperity, to deliver good governance, and to continue the fight against poverty and corruption, to ensure the country was able to feed itself and not rely on handouts. I also understood that to sustain growth and prosperity, the country needed to be unified, uphold democratic governance and the right of the people to elect their leaders freely and fairly. I reflected on the need to educate our nation and to ensure our young generation had life-sustaining skills through strong economic growth and to have a healthy nation. I believe that this, in turn, would provide the necessary economic opportunities to our citizenry. Political leaders have a responsibility to listen to their people, not to their own egos. The people of Zambia have also basic needs to put food on their table, to have the opportunity to find work, and to be granted the dignity to be able to select and hold accountable their political, accountable their political leaders. These goals cannot be met without a fair system and strong economic growth. And my government was faced with accomplishing this task in the face of the world global economic recession, the biggest in recent history. So the question is how we were able to grow the economy in these conditions. As a small economy, we could not stop the recession, but we could prepare for when it would end. I convened, I convened a special <clears throat> committee of our top economic minds to plan and prepare our nation for the end of the recession, to ensure that we saved as many jobs as possible and had sufficient food supply and set the stage for economic diversification away from the copper sector through improving of our infrastructure. We worked to provide support to the key sectors <clears throat> of the economy, such as agriculture, energy, health, education, tourism, and manufacturing. This was a huge challenge, but we did score some exemplary successes in those areas. We sought to take advantage of Zambia's geopolitical position as a natural trade hub by building and repairing thousands of kilometers of our roads. We made a dedicated investment to improve facilities at schools, at health centers, and hospitals, and even introduced mobile hospitals on a large scale to deliver quality health, quality health care to the remotest parts of our vast country. As a government, we were eager to deliver results to our people. For the agricultural sector, which makes up about 21.5% of the GDP, we continued to provide support in the kind in kind to the small and vulnerable farmers to obtain better planning and efficient operations. As a result, the country experienced three consecutive bumper harvests during my tenure. 
These contributed significantly to our strong gross domestic growth. The industrial sector, in particular mining, received our close attention during the crisis and several major mines gave indications they were due to close. My administration personally intervened and the government stood ready to take over any such mines which were to close. In fact, one mining company did close down and we took on the ownership of that mine and immediately found investors who were ready to keep it operational. By doing this, we were able to save thousands of jobs in Zambia, whilst mines in other countries around the world continued to shut down operations and shed jobs. To boost manufacturing, we introduced multi-facility economic zones to encourage value addition to the abundant raw materials produced in Zambia, such as copper, the many minerals, and agricultural produce. Another major focus for our recovery strategy during the crisis was boosting the tourist industry by building infrastructure, such as airports and hotels, and reducing visa fees for intended visitors. This successfully enabled us to tap into South Africa's hosting of the World Cup in 2010, producing record growth in the number of visitors who came to enjoy Zambia's famous natural beauty. But what I am most proud of during my presidency is less visible. It was our administration's steadfast refusal to allow the executive branch to encroach on other branches of government, to stand by the principles of democracy that had been damaged in the past. This led to a spirited, competitive environment, sometimes to the detriment of my administration, but fully within the boundaries of what we should expect in a normal democracy. There were also deep misunderstandings fueled by hostile newspaper editors who chose to back, to back the opposition party. In particular, my government was criticized over a Zambian court's decision regarding the former president, now the late Frederick Chiloa may so rest in peace, who had been found guilty of corruption in a civil case by the London High Court. Essentially, I was being demanded as president to personally intervene in the judicial process and violate the separation of powers to force the judiciary to uphold the British decision against Chiloa, who it must be recognized was seen as an, an enormously popular leader by a large number of people in the country. Notwithstanding that Chiluba once jailed me as a political prisoner, my administration chose to uphold the Constitution and allow the legal system to exercise its authority without executive intervention. When my presidency began, we continued the fight against corruption and sought to base these anti-corruption efforts on a sound statutory framework that would conduct prosecutions in a lawful manner. One of the most important measures we took was to streamline the the prosecutorial bodies by moving the anti-corruption task force under the police to improve its efficiency, deepen access to resources, and cut back on all the redundancies. If there is one thing that I regret during my presidency, it is that our communications effort regarding these decisions could have been much better. The move of the task force to serve 
under the police, which by, by the way, was essential to the improvement of the anti-corruption drive. There were three reasons why we moved the task, task force to go under the police. One, to avoid the spiraling costs. And two, to restore presumption of innocence and due process. And three, to protect against personal and political manipulation. When the task force functioned in, independently, investigators were enormously wasteful of the budget, scheduling expensive and unnecessary trips to Europe and to the United States, and then coming up with very weak cases, often accusing some corrupt individual of a fraud in the amount that represented less than one-tenth of the budget wasted by the task force in bringing the case to trial. Further, before my reforms and task force operated on the principles of guilty until proven innocent and were notoriously famous for using the press to conduct trials by headlines, sometimes even resulting in newspaper editorials not real investigations and evidence being presented to the judge. Lastly, having the task force separate from the police opened it up to personal and political manipulation with the appointment of members of the ruling party to key positions to guide prosecutions. I continue to believe that our cooperating partners, that is the donor community, were critical to our anti-corruption efforts because we failed to communicate all these concerns and that there was a, a failure on behalf of the West to understand how an anti-corruption fight can become corrupted itself. One of the main reasons Zambia has continued to experience these challenges despite our reasonably strong democracy and growing economy was that we still had a fragile institutional and legal framework. For instance, the constitutional review process undertaken by a special commission formed by a parliamentary act has been going on since August 2008. The past two elections were held with all the political parties raising constitutional issues relating to the fairness of the elections. Nonetheless, the last two elections, which were judged as free and fair by all observ international observers, were upheld and the results accepted. Zambians are still struggling to have a popularly driven constitution to guarantee the people's rights and to protect this fragile democracy from the abuses of its rulers. For a growing democracy to have an acceptable constitution that meets the approval of the majority of the people of a country that is important. Therefore, I see the entrenchment of democracy in Zambia happening once we have a people-driven constitution that is not subject to manipulation year after year. For instance, on repeated occasions, the people of Zambia have voiced their support to change our electoral system to election by majority, known as in Zambia 50 plus one. Currently, the, pres the president becomes elected on a first-past-the-post format, which means that we do not have runoff elections, despite often having three or more parties winning more than 10%. These are issues that need to be resolved under the current constitutional review process. Notwithstanding the continuing work on our constitution, our government, during my stewardship, 
continued to strengthen institutions to underpin the country's governance system, such as the Anti-Corruption Commission, the Office of the Auditor General, the Police Service, the Electoral Commission, Parliamentary Office in the constituencies, and so on. As a relatively small nation on the global stage, Zambia remains dependent on foreign investment and relations with both trade partners and donor countries. As such, the rise of China's presence in Africa and the management of these east-west tensions became an important issue of our government. When we were facing the challenge of financing construction and rehabilitation, rehabilitating our infrastructure in the various sectors, it became clear that we needed to seek financing quickly and could not delay our plans to develop the country. The rise of new financial powerhouses in Asia, as you all know, is pro producing a geopolitical shift, and Africa is far from the only place where these new leaders and investors are going. Even Europe these days is propped up from Indian, Malaysian, and Chinese finance. So it is far from unique that Zambia experienced diversification. In some cases, we had successful partnerships with the West, including the United States government and the U.S. companies. However, in other cases, increasingly, our needs were matched by the Chinese. They offered the financing we needed and the technical know-how, and so it followed we should negotiate with them on certain projects. This did not always sit well with our cooperating partners from the West who, discomforted by new Eastern presence in Africa, would make unfounded allegations of impropriety and unreasonable demands to know the details of loan conditions and pricing of competitive bids, which were not only false and damaging to us, but also to the welfare of our people. For as much as the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union played out in various struggles for influence among African countries, often damaging regions' democratic development. There is a new economic struggle for the influence between the East and the West that touches not just Zambia, but many young democracies in Africa. It is my hope that any disputes arising out of Eastern investments in Africa can be successfully managed in a collaborative manner and that decision makers in the West adopt a more long-term vision of these emerging relationships rather than the, myopic, the myopia that has characterized some of more regrettable exchanges between our countries. There is this proverbial saying that describes this, that when two elephants fight, the grass suffers. And we have suffered. A good partner does not seek to limit the choices of the other. Instead, a good partner mutually benefits from the success of the other. What I've just summarized is my record of accomplishments and the geopolitical environment in which I tried to meet the challenges I faced. As I said, I am proud of what we did. So I must admit, I was surprised that even in a crowded field of opponents, we did not receive a popular mandate to build on our successes. While we didn't work miracles with the economy, we did work wonders. Again, over 7% growth during a worldwide recession is pretty good by any measure. If President Obama had my numbers, I don't think 
he would be worried about the reflection of his book. Thank you. While strong economic indicators are important, as I am sure you have studied here in this prestigious institution, it's not just the statistics, but the perceived state of things on the ground that ultimately matters more. From as much economic growth as was generated under the three different MMD presidencies, it became apparent that the expectations of our young population to share in this growth had not yet been met. In fact, I recently discussed this with Ambassador Steith in some detail over dinner a few days ago and read his article in African Business on how to contain spontaneous social combustions and couldn't agree more with him. Zambia is one of the most urbanized countries in Africa and also features a very young population. About 38% or more of our population live in urban areas and the median age is about 17 years. As the economy has grown, our people, particularly those in these urban areas and the youth, have become increasingly disillusioned and have been looking for an answer to why there are so there are no jobs for them, why there are no opportunities for them to earn a decent living. This leaves young, young democracies vulnerable, even though progress is being made through a democratic process. The real question remains unresolved jobs. These young people are left unemployed, hungry, and angry, and open to radical ideas which can destabilize any country, whether it is a functioning democracy or not. When you have sharp inequality, democracy becomes threatened because certain parties are able to seize political power by promising impossible, restrictive policies. In other words, populism, which also carries with it dangerous tones of nationalism, initiatives for expropriations, which scare away foreign investment, and a highly politicized treatment of the judiciary. The kind of transformation my government was working towards does not happen overnight. It takes years of hard work to incorporate everyone into the economy. And despite recognizing this process, I can fully appreciate the impatience that many Zambians felt to be included in the growth. This means that even when the economy has emerged from negative growth and all the microeconomic indicators have shown positive performance, this has not translated into real change in the lives of many of our young people. That is where the role of the regional and the international community comes in to support the development of democracy in Africa. I recently served as the leader of an observer mission on behalf of the Carter Center to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I saw firsthand, where I saw firsthand, the important influence that mature democracies can have on international organizations relative to their assistance of fragile systems. There is also a growing responsibility on behalf of multilateral regional institutions to take part in upholding democracy in member countries. For instance, when I served as chairman of the organ on politics, defense, and security, cooperation of the Southern African Development Community, SADC, we convened a special meeting of all political parties in Madagascar 
at the SADC Secretariat in Gaberon, where we were successful in outlining a proposed roadmap for the peace process in Madagascar. This type of support, be it regional, multilateral, or international, is critical for the success of democracy in Africa and must be aimed at upholding the rules of the system rather than the endorsement of selected candidates. These types of organizations and programs require funding, require support and political will. It is my hope that the students in this audience today, as the next generation of leaders, will encourage your governments to support the efforts of Africans to raise the profile of democratic development in Africa. We have a recent, at recent time, we have in recent times observed developed countries intervening directly to support the will of the people. The most recent example being the Arab Spring. It is obviously hard to ignore and we shouldn't ignore the cries of people yearning to be free. Having said that, it is important to understand the implications of such interventions. Sometimes there are unintended consequences. When the NATO made the decision to intervene in Libya, thousands of Tuareg a tribe from the north of Africa, called Tuareg, mercenaries in Gaddafi's employee, employ, in Gaddafi's employee, fled after his fall. Heavily armed, they went into Mali in waves causing the instability we are witnessing in Mali right now. This is clearly a case where intervention to remove a dictator and promote democracy in one country has had an undesirable outcome in another country. <coughs> From my experience as the president of Zambia, what I can tell you is that democracy and good governance is a never ending job. It is not something that is accomplished and then just left to stand alone. It must always be strengthened, respected, and upheld. Democracy also requires a culture of acceptance. The people of the country must understand that even when their candidate loses and the other candidate wins, it is still their government. That is why the expectations of the people need to be managed in African democracies acquiring that, uh, requiring that leaders be honest and transparent with their citizens. Despite the challenges that yet remain, I think my continent is getting there. As you say, in the West, Rome wasn't built in a day. We are building democracies on the continent. It is Africa's day. Despite setbacks like the one in Mali, we will continue to move forward. And noted in the African presidential, in the African presidential center's fact sheet on democracy in Africa, 10 years ago, there were 11 democratically retired African heads of state. Today, there are 34. With the help of friends like the United States, the energy and encouragement of the next generation of leaders symbolized by the students in this room, Africa's future is full of promise and our young people like yours here in America will have cause to dream. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, President Bonda has agreed to uh, uh, take some questions. You may be seated. Uh, we have uh, a number of interns uh, circulating uh, throughout the audience. Uh, one over here, <coughs> one over here, uh, with microphones. And we would ask that you uh, wait for them to bring you the microphone before uh, your question. And I would also punctuate uh, that you make uh, 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 your uh, responses questions uh, and not <laughs> many speeches. Uh, Tim Longman, the director of the African Studies Center here. Uh, one of the issues that your opponent in the recent elections uh, used to gain popularity was scapegoating the Chinese and their role in Zambia. Uh, I'm curious uh, how you responded to that and what you see as the future role of China in Zambia, because it clearly was a, a major issue in the campaign. Yes. Thank you very much. Obviously, he didn't know the important role, because once he became president, He's the first president who invited all Chinese in Zambia to have lunch at State House. I never did that. <laughs> I think that uh, you have to give him time. As he settles in, he will realize the realities of running a government and providing for the many poor people in his country. And rather than use this as, a, uh, as he did against me, but it doesn't worry me. He also promised the people that he would give them, they would have money in their pockets within 90 days. Uh, I didn't bother because I knew it was not true. It was not possible. Uh, but the people believed. So they elected him. Now it's his responsibility to provide the money in the pocket for the people. Thank you. President. Very Tiermo here. Thank you for the great uh, lecture. Uh, my question is this. We had uh, the ambassador, former ambassador to, to the US from South Africa here. And he also mentioned the economic ties of South Africa to China. Um, we've seen this across Africa. So what is the US doing wrong? Why are African nations which are experiencing economic growth partnering with China and not the US? I don't think that uh, really uh, it should be looked at that way because all of us are going to China. I, I was in China and uh, at the palace, thank you. at the palace where they uh, uh, put me up, a beautiful place, <clears throat> the last president, visiting president, last president in residence at the palace was President Obama. And as I was leaving, I was reading the newspaper and seeing on BBC, the uh, British were sending a big delegation from there. Everybody is going to China, they're going to India, they're going to Malaysia, they're going to the United States, as you can see here. I think it's good that the world should go everywhere and work together. That's why I am asking our, <clears throat> our partners, yourselves, to understand us. Because if the situation in Africa gets better, we will have more money to trade with you as well here in the United States. There is no, it's not a choice. It's not like was the case between uh, Africans and the socialist countries, which went with ideology and uh, taking a position against, uh, uh, against the Western countries. This is different. We're all going there. Thank you. Let's uh, get this side of the room. <clears throat> Good evening, President Banda. Um, my question uh, is uh, about the manufacturing industry. Uh, during the UNIP uh, regime, uh, we, Zambia had so many industries. And then I know when MMD came into power, uh, most of those industries were no more. Uh, what role did you play as the, res uh, as the president when it came to like, manufacturing and revamping that industry? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. That is true. During uh, Dr. Gaunda's time, there were a lot of industries, but there were also a lot of mines. If you recall, ZCCM 
and he was taken over, took over all the mining interests in the country. So what, what happened was that uh, the price of copper went down and uh, many of the big mining houses, like Anglo-American, left the country uh, because they couldn't sustain these, uh, <clears throat> these mines. And like on the copper belt, uh, most of the manufacturing com companies were in existence to service the big mining companies. So once they got into problems, the industries also got into problems. But as you, you will agree now, uh, if you have been home recently, I'm assuming you're from Zambia, if you have been home now, you will see a lot of industries have come up. And we, uh, we even have a, a free zone I have my economic advisor, you can remind me if I forget the name or the figures, but we, we, have, uh, uh, we are even building a, a brand new free zone to bring in manufacturers from all over the world. We give them incentives, special incentives for those. Uh, some of them are already functioning on the copper belt. In Lusaka, there are about three or four, but the biggest one, the one I'm talking about, is in Lusaka. So we believe that the, the, this route that we are taking, as <clears throat> we were taking as a government and as MMD, actually would result in more industries, more manufacturing, more restaurants, more farms, more people producing beef because the population can afford it now, or could afford it. I don't know what it is now, the last... Uh, Few, few weeks, but the truth is that the country was growing in all sectors of the country. And as you will remember, some of you were a little bit older and came to the States a bit earlier, there were uh, most of our roads had broken down completely. The bridges were broken. People could not travel from one province to the other uh, without difficulties. But once the mines started to function, the price of Copper went up. We allowed more private mines to come. We let more or less give up the government interest uh, in the in the mines. The, we were able to earn enough money from these mines to rebuild our country to the point where we were actually rated as the middle-income uh, country. Thank you. Miss Muape, there. I remember that name very well. Let's, let's come to the middle of the room, and let 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 me suggest, if, if this is okay, Mr. Yes, President, okay. we take two or three questions yes, together. Okay, okay, let's do that. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. My name is uh, Reverend Chilombo Muape. As you said, that's my first name. Thank you yes. to remember my name. I remember. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the time when elections were being conducted, we were here. But I want to congratulate you that uh, it's not easy uh, to step down and you know give in willingly. I want to say congratulations for actually taking that step. I want to say thank you to BU to have uh, the opportunity of inviting you. This is a way of healing in a situation where you led the nation and you are in leadership. We will support you. We are behind you as Zambians. And I believe that Lord, the Lord, in every situation, uh, there's the beginning and an ending. And there's no road that is smooth. We'll continue praying for you and your family. Thank you. And I'm sure that you continue to support Zambia. As you said in the beginning, you mentioned that you know there's poverty in that country. That's the youth, they want jobs. Question. Yes, <laughs> thank you. There's so much, but I want to congratulate the president and uh, Mrs. Banda. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> you better just answer this, and then we can have the other two questions. It's easier if they're in twos rather than three. Yeah, it is true, I am healing. I know it. Uh, every time I go, you know, when you've been president, everything is done for you. Uh, you, <laughs> you want to go into a shop, everybody leaves, uh, just you and the shop uh, attendant. We don't even go there, they bring everything for you. And you want to buy a ticket to fly, you, you send somebody, or they send themselves and bring you the ticket. Now, to come here after I was president no more, 
I find I'm just an ordinary person and I'm so happy about it. <laughs> I'm able to walk in my street there. I don't need any bodyguards. I, I can walk into any shop. Nobody asks me who I am, etc., etc. So this has given me a great opportunity to uh, go back to normalcy, to ordinary people. Two questions. Yeah. Oh. Let's, let's, and, and, and again, what we're trying to do here is get everybody in. So you need to be respectful of the effort to get your colleagues' questions, so make them questions precise, sharp, to the point. Let's do, uh, get, let's get one more in the middle of the room and then we'll get one up, up there, Pierre, I'm ready. Uh, good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Grace Mwanza. Uh, my question is, um, I know that Zambia has been experiencing a problem with HIV AIDS and there are so many orphans there. What did your government do or what, uh, during your tenure of office, what did you do in order to help the orphans in Zambia? Thank you. Thank you very much. Second question. Um, my question to you is, what was the impact of Zambia winning the Africa Cup of Nations this year? And um, <laughs> what, did, what, did, what did it mean to you personally? And one last thing I want to say is, one Zambia, one nation. Yeah, yeah thank you. <clears throat> well, I like uh, both questions very much. <laughs> I'll answer the easier one, honestly. I, am, uh, I was before a leader in football. I was... Uh, as vice president of the Football Association of Zambia. I started the football supporters club called Bola Bola, where Zambians always followed. I think you remember many of you followed their team wherever they went. And this particular country in which we won this, and by the way, I went to, to Gabon together with Dr. Kaunda and uh, the vice president of our country now, uh, Dr. Scott, and the first thing that struck the people of that country was, oh, one president, the one the vice president is representing, the first president of the country, and the immediate past president, all of you are still alive and you're outside prison. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very impressed with us, I'm telling you. And uh, you can't imagine what that did to our country, the unity, that it brought to our people. Everyone of every age uh, was just in a jubilant mood for as long as you can imagine. Uh, we are very, very pleased about that. And I am particularly pleased because the preparations for this particular team <clears throat> started during my time. I started to set up a committee uh, of all interested parties, business, people, football people, church people, all of us we used to meet at State House to set up a, to, to prepare ourselves to qualify for the Africa Cup and qualify for the World Cup. We've never qualified for the, uh, for the World Cup and we've never gotten the Africa, <clears throat> the Africa Cup. So we met and everyone was so supportive. The, I think in one meeting alone we raised more than $2 million. If you take the cars, brand new cars that they gave us to transport the coaches, because we couldn't even afford coaches. You know, it was so expensive. The Football Association of Zambia doesn't have that kind of money. But people threw money at us <clears throat> in order to prepare for this. So you can imagine how we felt. And I was with my old man, KK, uh, when we went there. And uh, I just uh, cannot describe it, all of us, when finally the whistle went and we had won. Just great joy. We won the, the penalty with Drogba. Nobody, nobody, could, nobody could beat Drogba when he got, when he got. <laughs> <laughs> she knows, yeah, this is incredible. It's, it's, uh, that's why Drogba, when he was asked, how did you miss the penalty? He said, I, I think these people were underground. <laughs> were also, also playing against us. The first question uh, from Ms. Mwanza is about AIDS and uh, what our government did. We worked very hard. We allocated a lot of money in the budget in, uh, in support of the AIDS programs. We also worked with our friends, and I'm happy that they are here. Many American organizations and the American government supported us to provide 
free medications for those afflicted with AIDS, HIV AIDS. We did everything. We gave it the most importance that we could. I uh, wish we could do, we have done more, but we're still continuing. And the, the figures, I think, uh, Dr. Chamber, you agree with me, the figures show, or oh, not Dr. Chamber, they're, they're Americans who have just come back. The figures, the figures show that we are actually improving in, in the fight against AIDS. Yeah. Uh, the last two. Uh, so one here. And one here. One here, one here. So you all better have good questions. <laughs> Dr. Hayward. And then, now, Rita, why don't you meet her right there so as soon as she finishes? Uh, uh, Linda Hayward uh, from African American Studies. And I, I want to thank you for your presentation and to say that when I lived in Zambia from 1980 to 1981, what I remembered most was the big trucks that came in to Zambia, you know, Somali drivers, and that whole connection with that transport. And you mentioned about the transport system being sort of not as it was. And one, you know, one would like to know and to see and to ask whether, in fact, this is going to be one of the priorities, because that connection with whether Angola, on the Angola side, or on the eastern side is so necessary for Zambia lam landlocked country. So I wanted to just get your reflections on what were in your plans during your presidency to deal with that uh, infrastructure. Hello, Your Excellency. Um, my name is Mary Warner, and I'm a new faculty member here at Boston University. I'd like to follow up on uh, Ms. Wanda's question and ask you um, what your administration might have done to help not only HIV and the other communicable diseases, but the non-communicable diseases that I'm sure plague your country, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. And so I'd like to hear if that's the, the big area of now that patients are living with HIV, um, what's happening on the front in Zambia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the road system, the road networks and transport, railways, uh, bridges, and all this, we have special emphasis on this. Not only for the roads that connect uh, the provinces, the main roads like uh, going to the northern province, to, to Tanzania or to Malawi, or uh, to Angola, and so on. We, during my time, spent a lot of time in thinking how to overcome this. And we're thinking, we're already negotiating with the Angolans, who have already started to build their railway uh, system towards Zambia. I think they're about 100, 200 kilometers now. But they have the money. We have to look for the money first. So, uh, we, but we, were, we have committees to attend to that problem. The road network connecting the provinces, all of them, we are located uh, some money, some from our treasury, some of it from our supporters, the European country, the European Union, and so on. We're going to build the road to, all the way to Malawi, and we're going to build the road to connect. We are building, as I'm speaking now, to connect to the northern province and the new province in Isoka, all the way to Tanzania. So we did a lot as far as the road network is concerned. But even internally in the cities, our cities, the roads had not been attended to for many, many years, as you all know, the, those who have been to Zambia or the Zambians themselves. And those who have just arrived today can testify to what I'm saying. We are building roads in the compounds, in the, in the areas where many of our people live. Uh, the roads had been completely forgotten. We used to repair the Cairo Road and this and that. But we decided to put a program together to fix all the roads in the compound, of course, giving priority which one's first. And, so. and we've started. We're building the roads in Livingston, the same in Choma, the same in uh, Mazabuka, the same in Kafue, Lusaka, all the way to the border with the, with the, um, uh, the Congo. And the same with the provincial capitals of, of our country at that time. There were only nine of them. Uh, most of the towns we had started to deal with the road network 
And our ambition was that if we had won, it would have intensified, deepened this road reconstruction program. Also, this morning, when we were talking to the president of uh, the university, we talked about the, the fact that these roads are not just for Zambia. They are also for Tanzania. They are also for Kenya. They are also for Ethiopia, and so on. We have uh, committees of the study, committees of the AU, whose business is to link up these roads uh, between our countries. Because we have a dream about our, uh, about our, our country. We believe sincerely that we can get there if only we are determined to spend the money for the right things. Thank you. Is there another question? The, the, the other question was well, about the football. The, uh, uh, the, the, no, no, we got to <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, You know, the, the, uh, health, health issues beyond HIV. Yes, health issues beyond HIV. Indeed, as I, as I said in my speech, the, we attach great importance to health, very much so. HIV, of course, the most dramatic. Everybody talks about it all over the world, but there are many of these other diseases that afflict our people, and that used to attack us every summer, every rainy season, because of bad drainage in our compounds and so on. We had uh, uh, all, uh, waterborne diseases uh, attacking our people and so on. We've tried to open up drainages, and uh, also we are building a new water system, which will come from Kafue, or bring the water from Kafue into Lusaka with clean water, etc. So we are attaching a lot of it. We were. Uh, I shouldn't speak as if uh, I didn't lose the elections. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is theirs. Let our colleagues do theirs. But we did pay a lot of attention to all these other diseases which our people are facing. Because it's wonderful to be in a country where you can see the impact of the health programs on the people. And they, like where we are. I was telling my wife that uh, yesterday we went to church. I'm sure you didn't notice it. It's normal to you. But we went to church and we saw the kids who were dancing. They were dressed up in angel, mm -hmm. like angels, and they were running around dancing to... Uh, to church music, and I was telling my wife that it is so wonderful to see totality of the kids looking so well, so strong. They were running fast and were dancing very physically and so on. This is something that uh, us African leaders uh, played my part. Those of you who are coming now must devote our time to improving the health of our people. That's yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.